The mule deer and the bighorn sheep are two of Wyoming's iconic species. These big game animals represent wild places and are historic benchmark species. But mule deer and bighorn sheep have suffered declines in numbers across the West and across Wyoming. We'll explore the management challenges facing these species this week on Wyoming Wildlife TV. Mule deer are adored by wildlife viewers and hunters alike. A few things portray the West like a wide-racked four-point mule deer. Mule deer are important to Wyoming for a lot of reasons, but to me the, the biggest thing is when, when people think of Western Wyoming, they think of big mule deer. I mean, that's what Western Wyoming has always been about, and that's what we're still about. Aside from that, they're important to revenue, they're important to, to the people of Wyoming, they're important to the people that visit Wyoming. They're really the base of a lot of what we have in Wyoming and they're the, the foundation for a lot of other wildlife as well. Mule deer are an important species in Wyoming because of the variety of habitat and environments they live in. They're, they're an animal that can adapt to various types of habitat and environment and thus they have become very important wildlife species for Wyoming. You got a pattern. Mule deer are one of the most sought after game animals by hunters. Mule deer hunting in Wyoming has changed dramatically in the past 30 to 40 years. Uh, our numbers of mule deer have declined substantially in, since the highs of the 1950s and 60s. Today's hunter is a trophy hunter. He's looking for size of animal, size of horns. In the past, mule deer was served on many a supper table in, in Wyoming. Today's hunters have changed for various reasons. Uh, the, you know, the, the new literature that's out, magazines, internet, uh, they're definitely hunting trophy mule deer, and that's what they're looking for. Up into the 1990s, hunters enjoyed phenomenal mule deer hunting in Wyoming. First of all, mule deer is about 50% uh, of my annual revenue, mule deer hunters that come hunt out of our camp. But it's also become uh, a, an idea that it's a personal thing for, for me. The, the mule deer are, in my mind, one of the hardest animals, quality-wise, one of the hardest animals to harvest. If you have enough money, you can buy an elk hunt on a fenced ranch, but very few places are offering mule deer hunters in that type of hunting. A uh, trip to the mountains, rugged hard work, the Grays River is world famous for those quality trophy bucks, so we do get hunters there. Uh, the one thing I can say is it's becoming a booking factor as far as hunters that uh, want to hunt with me. We still have good mule deer hunting, and if a guy goes out and puts in his time and effort and uh, really gets after it, he can find a, a nice buck in Wyoming. But the, the numbers are not, not what they were, and, and I guess to me the bigger concern is the recovery isn't what it once was. Mule deer in the West have historically been significant in, in that they've always uh, been part of the pioneer's diet, and in the recent years they've been part of the economic engine of the state wildlife agency. They've been the primary animal that they've hunted, they've, they've received license revenue, so they're a big boon to the economy. But also mule deer have had a mystique oh, throughout the West. They've always been the species that you could hunt with your family and friends, and you always counted on there being mule deer in, in your backyard that you could go hunting on, on any weekend. Today, mule deer numbers are down across much of their range. Mule deer in the west are on a decline. Uh, they have been for several years. 
for a lot of reasons, and uh, their populations are at about half of what they were at their historic highs. The peaks of the herds have become lower and lower. They're not, not what they once were, and uh, probably a bigger factor than that is that historically, when a herd would, would uh, crash due to a severe winter, usually a five or six year recovery and the herd had come back. And what we've seen this last go around is the herds uh, really struggling to come back. We had big herds back in 91, 92. We had a crash and they really have never quite recovered. Mule deer populations are certainly lower now than they were even, even uh, in the 80s. But nevertheless, I would say that in Wyoming, we still enjoy a mule deer population that's relatively abundant and uh, still provides good opportunity, recreation opportunity, whether you're a hunter, you're a hunter, or, um, you know, somebody that just enjoys wildlife. But uh, we've got a lot of challenges, a lot of management challenges that we need to um, pay particular attention to maintain the species into the future. Factors affecting mule deer and the state's approach when we return. The surge of energy development has misplaced mule deer and led to fragmentation of winter range. Certainly in Wyoming, we're an energy state, uh, and so we have a lot of oil and gas development uh, throughout the state and mule deer habitats. Some of those are critical habitats. And of course, when you have that kind of development, there's gonna be some, some cost associated with it in terms of wildlife habitat, and certainly mule deer uh, and their habitats are, are affected by um, the vast amount of oil and gas production that's going on. Through the course of seven years of development in Pinedale, we've actually seen uh, deer numbers in the gas field decline by approximately 30%. The big question is, well, is that reduction in deer due to gas development or is it due to long-term drought or other environmental factors that may be influencing deer across the region? And so we can look at deer numbers across the entire region and they've only declined 10% during that same time period. And so right now, at least through seven years of development, the best available evidence suggests that once we take a native winter range, convert it to a producing gas field, that winter range simply cannot support the number of deer that it did prior to development. We obviously have a lot of oil and gas development, uh, mining, uh, a lot of resource extractions here in the state. You know, there's concern over urban sprawl. There's also concern over management of predators uh, throughout the state. Mule deer management is a highly complex issue. And, and, you know, wildlife managers are faced with trying to look at all these different factors that have multiplying impacts on mule deer populations and trying to juggle those and figure out where to, where to focus their energy and effort. We certainly believe um, that there's a balance with that kind of development and maintaining those habitats. It can be done. I would suggest that, you know, in this day and age of a high demand for energy, that that balance may be a little bit tipped. I think we're starting to get a good handle on how energy impacts uh, winter ranges and mule deer on their winter range. But one of the big information gaps or unknowns now is how energy development affects or doesn't affect migration and migration routes. So our current research is trying to focus on that question of what happens when we develop these migration routes. Do deer simply quit migrating? Do they migrate right through the development, business as usual? Or do they just move around the development and establish new migration routes? Those are all real unknowns that we'll try to address in the future. The Mule Deer Foundation is hard at work protecting and conserving deer habitat. The Mule Deer Foundation's mission is very simple, is to ensure the conservation of mule deer, black-tailed deer and their habitat. And how we do that is we fundraise through local fundraising banquets, uh, national convention, a lot of different ways we raise money. And our goal is to put as much of that money back on the ground to improve mule deer habitat, to ensure that there's mule deer habitat in the future, 
and to um, continue to make sure that there will always be mule deer out there for all of us to enjoy. People ask us as an organization, are we trying to restore mule deer to their historic numbers? And generally I'll tell people no. We try to restore mule deer to the carrying capacity of their habitat. And what that means is, is that there's enough food and water and grass and, and other things that they need that will sustain that population that is there. We're not interested in growing large populations of mule deer that will come to the winter range and end up starving to death and dying, but we want to keep them in balance with their habitat. The Mule Deer Foundation wishes we could do more to help mule deer but it takes a lot of dollars over a large area. And we can only do that if we have partnerships with state agencies like the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, um, and other groups like that that uh, are dedicated to conservation of wildlife. And so together we can do more than we can do alone. Wyoming Game and Fish's new mule deer initiative aims at addressing issues related to this species. The Game and Fish Department, recognizing that mule deer populations are, have and, and continue to decline to some degree, responded to that by forming um, what we're calling the Mule Deer Working Group. And that working group is a, is a group of biologists and wardens um, throughout the entire state that have focused a lot of time, energy, and, and expertise on developing some recommendations to better manage mule deer. And the Mule Deer Initiative is an umbrella document that summarizes all the issues that we face as mule deer managers in this state and provides recommendations and strategies how to perhaps best address some of those issues. Probably the most important aspect of the Mule Deer Initiative, however, is the public participation aspect and getting the people of Wyoming more engaged and engaged at a different level in helping us manage this important resource for them. The Mule Deer Initiative will also help us to better prioritize uh, habitat improvement projects and population management projects and, and other activities that are, that are vital to improving mule deer management. Help us focus more attention on, on those projects, better prioritize them and also secure funding, uh, which is always kind of the bottom line. Uh, we need the money to get a lot of these things done. We look at bighorn sheep management and conservation when Wyoming Wildlife TV returns. Prior to the arrival of settlers and the introduction of domestic sheep, the noble bighorn thrived across the state. Sheep are a symbol of the wildness of the Rocky Mountain West and the state of Wyoming. They're a majestic animal. They live in rugged, remote country. And as long as we have healthy uh, wild sheep populations in this state, at least we'll know we're doing something right for wildlife habitat. They represent what is truly wild about the West uh, and Wyoming as well. Uh, the image of the bighorn ram standing on top of a sheer cliff face is one that just uh, passes on to people in the country um, a vision of, of true wilderness and wildness. Now, the history of bighorn sheep in southeast Wyoming is that in the 1870s, uh, from uh, records that we can obtain, uh, traveler records and things like that, um, pioneer records that bighorn sheep were fairly abundant in southeast Wyoming through the 1870s. Even with the uh, arrival of European settlement in the mid-18 to late 1800s, those animals that occurred in the northwestern part of the state were sort of sheltered from the impacts associated with European settlement, including disease, market hunting, and other impacts to the species. Um, in uh, many other parts of Wyoming, especially in the central and southeastern mountain ranges of Wyoming, bighorn sheep were extirpated around the early part of the 19th, uh, 1900s. We don't know really what the exact cause of that was. Uh, there's lots of speculation, but really we don't know for sure, but we do know that by that time they were about gone. Since that time, we've utilized native bighorn sheep in the northwestern part of the state, especially the Whiskey Basin population near Dubois, to reintroduce bighorns into the central and southeastern corners of Wyoming. And currently, we have um, a multitude of reintroduced populations uh, near Laramie, uh, Saratoga, Casper that are, are doing fairly well right now. Bighorn numbers have declined due to a number of factors. 
We're a very low populated state. You know, the impacts of man, the footprint of man uh, is, is rearing its head here as well. Um, in time, if we're not careful and we don't manage appropriately, we're going to have problems with, uh, with our wildlife. We've still got fairly robust wild sheep populations. And so, uh, you know, there are certainly threats, whether it's human footprint type things on, on uh, crucial bighorn sheep ranges. But I'm optimistic that bighorn sheep are going to be here for a long time. You know, probably the biggest threats, uh, in my mind, have to do with this vegetative succession in the absence of fire. You know, we're losing some habitat in Wyoming. Sheep are very reliant on open, they're having a wide open view. And as pine trees continue to expand into that country, it's just less and less suitable for wild sheep. So having an active burn program to set back some of that uh, conifer encroachment is, is very important on the sheep ranges. Currently, Wyoming estimates about 6,200 sheep, plus another couple hundred in Yellowstone Park, so mid 6,000 range. It's a bit lower than it was, say, 10 to 15 years ago. There's been a bit of a downturn, primarily due to some uh, mortality at one of our bigger herds over by Dubois, the Whiskey Basin herd, that's dropped in half from roughly 13 or 1400 to around six to 700. That's been a big hit. But overall, they're doing quite well compared to many Western states. Domestic sheep can come in contact with bighorns, and many diseases have been spread to wild sheep due to this commingling. We know that there's uh, been instances where domestic sheep populations in close proximity to bighorn populations have resulted in bighorns succumbing to pneumonia uh, through contact with those domestic flocks. Um, and so there's just a multitude of vectors that can cause sheep to contract pneumonia, primarily because they don't have resistance to it. And once that occurs then, um, generally speaking, the severity of the, the loss of animals is pretty significant, sometimes approaching 90 percent of the population. The debate between disease transmission between domestic sheep and wild bighorn sheep is still uh, very contentious. Um, even the experts uh, qu uh, quarrel amongst themselves on what is exa exactly is going on. Domestic sheep and goats carry a, a strain of pastorella bacteria which they have become immune to and through close contact with each other they can pass that on to wild sheep the wild sheep don't have any immunity to that bacteria, develop pneumonia, and usually end up dying. Um, we have, I think, a great working relationship here in the state of Wyoming with the domestic sheep industry. Uh, they recognize the concerns that we have, and you know we've worked very carefully with them. The department, and uh, in conjunction with our uh, very uh, tremendously beneficial NGOs, including the Wyoming chapter for the North American Wild Sheep Foundation and the National uh, Wild Sheep Foundation, um, have been great partners in trying to maintain and increase the distance between domestic sheep herds and bighorn sheep populations, especially in the northwestern part of the state in our core native ranges. If you look at the country that wild sheep live in, it's some of the roughest, most spectacular country anywhere. And they've got to be hardy, tough animals to survive through deep snows, uh, long winters, etc. But from a respiratory standpoint, they're, they're fairly wimpy. And so if they're challenged with some bacterial pneumonia that might be introduced either from another bighorn or perhaps from a domestic sheep or goat, uh, they can be very susceptible to those uh, huge die-offs that maybe you know, encompass 70% or more of a population. There's a real effort underway in the western U.S. and Canada to ensure separation between domestic sheep and wild sheep on, say, public land grazing allotments because of that risk. Transplant efforts, education, and habitat protection and enhancement when we return. Wyoming Game and Fish continues to transplant sheep in an effort to start new populations. Probably the three biggest things that we do involve uh, transplants. We are actively involved with some bighorn sheep transplants in the state of Wyoming where we've brought sheep in from other jurisdictions. Uh, we've gotten sheep from Montana and two different instances from Oregon here in the last couple of years. And so that helps us augment our populations. For about 50 years or more, the Game and Fish Department has transplanted sheep from Whiskey Mountain over by Dubois, or the Whiskey Mountain herd, and tried to establish populations in these low elevation, dry, ha drier habitats. Those sheep over at Whiskey Mountain 
migrate up to the high country where they spend most of the summer living in alpine habitats. We take those sheep and put them into dry country like we have here in Shell Canyon and in Devil's Canyon. They just never did quite adjust. So we went to Oregon and got some sheep from drier habitats, brush dominated countryside. So far things are looking good. We have great lamb survival, great survival of the adults, and good reproduction. We got 20 sheep from Oregon over on the, along the Deschutes River. It, uh, that was released was in December of 2004. And we had planned a second transplant from that same area, but the state of Oregon came and told us that they didn't think they had enough sheep to spare. So we kind of scrambled the second year and uh, finally got some sheep out of the uh, Missouri River breaks in Montana. And there again, the second year, January of 2006, we released 20 more sheep into Devil's Canyon. With, the, with those sheep we put in, the ones that were there previously, and the production since, we estimate there's about 120 to 140 animals up there now. The National Bighorn Sheep Interpretive Center exists to educate the public about the biology and habitat needs of the Rocky Mountain Bighorn Sheep and to encourage the active stewardship of wildlife and wild lands. The Wild Sheep Foundation strives to protect and enhance habitat for bighorns with on-the-ground projects. The uh, mission of the Wild Sheep Foundation is to enhance wild sheep populations, uh, support professional wildlife management, educate the public about conservation uh, and about wild sheep, also the conservation benefits of hunting. Uh, we also encourage fair chase hunting and uh, um, keep our administrative costs to a minimum. In the past 31 years, the Sheep Foundation and our chapters have contributed over $70 million to on-the-ground programs that benefit wild sheep, other wildlife, and the wild places that they depend upon for their survival and, and health. Although our mission includes educating the public, promoting professional wildlife management, promoting fair chase hunting, and promoting and protecting the rights and interests of hunters, our primary is interest is on sheep conservation and wildlife conservation. We've, uh, we've worked very closely with federal land agencies uh, that uh, administer federal lands here in Wyoming, also the state game department as well, in uh, trying to mitigate certain problems that we, we have with uh, wild sheep. Also, uh, a relationship with the livestock producers, uh, mainly the uh, domestic sheep producers here in Wyoming. We've had a good relationship with and been able to work through some problems that have allowed bighorn sheep to prosper. People that are interested in uh, helping bighorn sheep and uh, helping other wildlife, you know, they can become a member of the Wild Sheep Foundation. Uh, we are very active in the uh, policy arena with uh, the federal land agencies, also all of the western uh, game agencies throughout uh, North America. We're very actively involved with that. We have a strong voice in those things. And if people want to be a part of that, they can become a member of the Wild Sheep Foundation and help assist with those, those issues. Mule deer and bighorn sheep, two species that define Wyoming and the West. Through diligence and stewardship, these animals will forever be enjoyed by the people of Wyoming. You know, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, there's a declining habitat base throughout the West in bighorn sheep habitat. Uh, we've also had about 100 years of fire suppression that has caused a reduction in habitat. All these are um, they're, they're issues that have been brought on by man, the footprint of man. And so we've got to mitigate those issues to help out uh, wild sheep and other wildlife. When you improve mule deer habitat or any habitat, um, it generally helps a lot of different wildlife species. And that's why when we do a project, we try to do a project that where we partner with other organizations and other groups to uh, make sure that we uh, make our dollars go farther and, uh, and try to help as many species as we can, not just mule deer. Uh, I'm optimistic that we'll have bighorn sheep in the future of Wyoming, uh, but there are some real concerns that I think all of us need to consider. People need to think about their choices, and if they value what it is we have in Wyoming, if people in wherever, in the East Coast, in the South, in the West, if they value the open spaces that we have in Wyoming, the abundant wildlife habitat that we have, as the people of the state of Wyoming do, then those choices are always important. I think it'd be a pretty sad world if we didn't have mule deer and other wildlife species as part of our daily lives.